and depending on uh, the the two the, the two pieces, it could be a seven hundred and fifty dollar penalty per year right. if or you don't do it, percent. or two and a half percent of your income, or something else. And at some point, even the administration said, well, even if you don't pay that, we're, we're going to have to at some point maybe throw somebody in jail. Let me ask you about the morality of of, of, of requiring an American just because he lives here to go buy a private product. Well, John, you is it's not you're required to have automobile insurance just like every other Coloradan. Um, we have a body. No, you I'm, have to I'm, have health insurance. I'm not required to buy if you auto have a car, insurance. You are, if you drive, I yeah. have a car, and if you have a body, you're required to have health care. Here's the issue, John. And as a libertarian, you should agree with this. If you, it, it's not like if you have a painting in your house, it's worth ten thousand dollars. Entirely up to you whether you insure it. Because if you don't, it gets destroyed. It's you know you lose it. No big deal. If it's your body and your health, if you don't insure yourself and then you have a heart attack, you break your arm, you go to the hospital, you can't pay. Uh, taxpayers pay and other people who are paying the bill. You will become a burden on other people. You're shifting your costs and making, you're forcing other people to pay for you because you didn't buy health care insurance. Let's, let's take a look at this. So on the, th there's two reasons I despise the individual mandate. One, I believe it's immoral and two, it doesn't work. You know, for government to say uh, you have to buy auto insurance, if you have an automobile, but if I don't drive, mm -hmm. if I take the bus, if I walk, if I'm, uh, if I don't, if I stay at home, I don't have to do that. Your model would work but fine if you had the ability, the legal ability, to opt out of emergency care. But, but no, we, we don't have that. If, if you're uninsured and you have no money and you get sick, or you, you go to the hospital and, and you force other people to take the shape of that. Burden. I don't That's force other people to do that. It's well, federal legislation well, does, that yeah. forces insure the hospitals to provide care. That's right. So wait a second. Let's see. It's the federal government government that requires uh, employers to buy people's health insurance. Now, my employer doesn't pick out my homeowner's policy. It doesn't pick out my uh, um, uh, uh, life insurance policy, my auto insurance policy, my umbrella policy. But the idea that my employer decides the quality of my health care is, is pretty damn bizarre. Well, that's a governmental mandate. You were talking about it's unfair that these people can get treatment. Well, it's a governmental federal mandate that if I show up at a hospital with a broken arm that they're going to, they're going to fix it. I don't have to go find a charitable organization to do it, but let me go to the other point. It doesn't work. If you want to compare it to automobile insurance, take a look at your automobile policy. You'll find that there's a rider there for uninsured motorists. We still have a, a horrendous amount of uninsured motorists. In Massachusetts, they have not put a sizable dent in the number of uninsured people in Massachusetts with their very expensive mandate. What's going to say that people are going to do this anyway? No, again, I think it's work for auto. If, if automobile insurance wasn't uh, required, a lot less people would have it. Are there people that violate the law and get tickets for it for not having it? Yeah, I'm sure there's some here in Colorado, but the vast majority of people have automobile insurance. Uh, we all have an interest in more people being insured because under the current system, if you're not insured, you are forcing taxpayers and other people who can pay. Uh, that's one of the reasons insurance rates have escalated so much. It's uncompensated care for people who don't have health care insurance. It's not a decision you make in isolation, like uh, whether to insure some prop personal property of yours. Uh, this now, will, again, if you have a this, if you this, have this not be the first time mm -hmm. in American history that the federal government has required individuals, just for fact of having a heartbeat and breathing, to buy a private product. Well, again, you're for, it's like you're right now you're forcing them to pay for people who are uninsured. I mean, you should be outraged. You're being forced to pay for uninsured Americans. I am. The, being, an, the answer is yes. This would be the first time so, the federal yeah, government has ever, has ever mandated that as, as because you breathe oxygen, you must buy a private product. You know, but again, I think you should. Why aren't, we just, why aren't you just as outraged that you have to pay for irresponsible people who, aren't, who choose not to buy insurance? Trust are you me. outraged about I, that? I am outraged that Thank you put you. together Good. that your federal <laughs> government puts out a mandate that that hospitals must care for them whether they want to or not. Now let's bring it back to, to uh, this issue of what's going to happen. In Massachusetts, they say here's the type of program you're going to buy. So if you wanted, for instance, a high deductible policy, a catastrophic policy, and you wanted something with a $10,000, $20,000 deductible, and you're going to pay for all the little stuff yourself, but if you contract a terrible disease, if you, if you get hit by, by light rail, you're going to be covered. But in Massachusetts, if you want that policy, you can't find it. It's against the law. So when Obama says, if you like your health care plan now, you'll be able to keep it, well, in Massachusetts, they weren't able to keep it. You know, why should government be able to tell me what type of product to buy? Not only that I have to buy a product, but what type? So here's um, one of the things that health care reform and all of those versions of the bill accomplish is they prevent pricing discrimination based on pre-existing conditions uh, or exclusions based on pre-existing conditions. You cannot do that 
without also having some kind of universality or mandate. Why? Because it would be rational if you just do the one to simply wait till you, you know, have cancer or need something and then you buy insurance. Um, and that's what everybody would do. And then that would forego the purpose of insurance. So if, if you eliminate pricing discrimination and pri different prices based on pre-existing conditions, you've got to have a university, universality aspect to it or, or you, nobody will be insured. Who gets to decide what, the, what deductible? Who gets to decide yeah. that I wanted a high deductible and Obama says, no, you need to get a low there's deductible? A, there's what, yeah, exactly. There's, there's going to be, there's, actually the bill promotes competition in the insurance industry. That's one of the things that's lacking now. Uh, there's, as you, what you're alluding to is there's a minimum level. We're saying below this level, it's not called insurance. Above this level, it is. Above this level, you can have whatever level of insurance you want, but to determine who's insured and who's not, there there needs to be a, a mineral, minimal defined level. And so, if a guy has, let's say, a ten thousand dollar deductible, mm -hmm. catastrophic plan, million dollar plan, is that insurance? That's that'll be determined on the the rulemaking side by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So, in other words, when Obama says, "If you like your plan now, you can keep it," that might not be true. Well, any of the, I think what he's talking about there is if you like your health care plan that you get through your work. I mean, this doesn't affect the vast majority of Americans who get their health care from middle and large size employers. This really affects, in a very positive way, and I speak as an entrepreneur, self-employed small businesses. Uh, they get the short end of the stick today. They don't have the buying power as large companies. They're more affected by pre-existing conditions. If you have three people, five people, they are the biggest beneficiaries under this. They'll be buying insurance through the exchanges uh, after this. We talk a lot about a competition. One of the things that the bill doesn't touch at all is cross-state purchasing of health care. Now, John Shattuck from Arizona tried to do this a couple years ago. If, if you know, Here in Colorado, we've got 50 different mandates. If I want to get a policy that doesn't have mental health coverage or maternity coverage, I can't buy it here. If it's available at a cheaper cost in Nebraska, and that because they don't have as many mandates, I can't buy it. Why don't you put some of these competitive things that insurance companies hate mm -hmm. in this bill, including cross-state purchasing and, heaven forbid, tie up the uh, tort lawyers a bit as well. The uh, Yeah, that was a, it was one of the great ideas. I, I had, what, you know, 30-some uh, town hall meetings across our district. One of the really good ideas I heard from a lot of constituents was why aren't we allowing interstate competition? The original bill, the one I voted against in committee, it didn't have anything in it. Uh, I am an advocate of that. I think we should do it. We, we do a little bit now in this newest version of the House bill. We establish interstate compacts. Uh, where they will have, so it won't be in every state, but it can be, you know, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico get together and say, you know what, across these, but it's, so we kind of empower the states to do it, but I do support uh, interstate competition. It's one of the, it's, it's a very good idea. That alone won't fix healthcare insurance, but it's a very good idea. But, you know, when you, when you add things like high deductible catastrophic plans mm -hmm. and you allow cross-state purchasing, so you can shop in all 50 states for a healthcare plan that you like, not what Obama or some bureaucrat in some fluorescent room in, in D.C. thinks you ought to have, and if you put in some tort reform, which this bill really doesn't have, it has a demonstration project, you know, yip-dee-dee, -dee. Yeah. you know, there's, there's nothing there that really opens up competition. Instead, you're putting a gun to every American's head saying you will buy a private product, and every insurance company loves this. I mean, talk about a boom for the big evil insurance companies. Isn't this plan one of those booms? Well, under under the uh, items that you articulated, uh, you'd still have the gun to your head forcing you to pay for people who choose not to be insured. Which you and that's could the fix. same gun you have today. Because that's a federal mandate, is it not? Uh, well, again, is that a, is that a requirement on, is it, that you're going to It is propose? a federal mandate, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. And so you could change that federal mandate. So what would you like us to do? I'd like to leave it to that, that up to the states. Whether a hospital has to treat yes. somebody who's uninsured? Yes. Okay, and then if, what if there was a state mandate? You'd still, it's gun would still be to your head. It would just be from the state. Right? That would be feds. from the state, and that's something we could take care of here in Colorado. Remember, I think those of us in Colorado can make, make those decisions. 